Hello and welcome to our module about antifungals. Here is the outline. We're going to talk about how fungi make their cell membrane and how they make their cell wall. And then we're going to talk about antifungals that target uh, their cell membrane and cell wall. We're going to talk about specific treatments for local, invasive, and skin-limited infections. Here is the fungi physiology. Fungi are very similar to eukaryotes, so we have to target what makes them different from us eukaryotes. So uh, when we target these uh, differences, we can reduce the amount of adverse effects when given antifungals. So the first thing that you're going to notice with this picture is that the fungus has a large cell wall made out of beta-glucans. So if we can target beta-glucan synthesis, like beta-glucan synthase, with uh, echinocandins, then we can inhibit their cell wall synthesis and uh, decrease their integrity. Another thing that uh, fungi have different from us is that they have ergosterol rather than cholesterol. So we can inhibit their ergosterol synthesis. We can inhibit it using terbinafine, which targets the first step, squalene epoxidase, or we could use azoles, which targets the second step, which is demethylase or cyclase, sometimes known as P, um, just a P450 general enzyme, and that prevents an, um, production of linosterol, which is the base for ergosterol. Another thing that we can do is we could just target the ergosterol that is inside of the cell membrane using amphotericin, and amphotericin will just target this and make pores inside of their cell membrane. Another thing we could target is their DNA and RNA synthesis or just their reproduction and, um, or replication in general. Uh, because they replicate faster, uh, th these, uh, this, this class of antifungals will actually damage the fungi more than us. So we can inhibit their DNA and RNA synthesis and we can also inhibit their microtubule formation during replication. Echinocandins, uh, they're a class of drugs that target the beta-glucan synthesis, synthase. So if you inhibit the beta-glucan synthesis, synthesis, you won't be able to have a cell wall, and that it decreases the integrity of the fungi and allows them to burst more easily. They are very easy to recognize because they all end in fungin, and I try to think of them as the fungi of penicillin, or fung again penicillin fungi and they target the cell walls just um, just like how penicillin would also target the integrity of the cell walls of bacteria uh, they're mostly used for aspergillus and candida in the case of an invasive set setting and by invasive i do mean systemic not just limited to the lungs or the skin adverse effects is gi upset but because uh, of how common that adverse effect is, that's not very likely to be asked. They may ask you about the flushing, and this flushing is due to histamine release. It's very similar flushing that you would expect from Redman syndrome, uh, seen with vancomycin, but not as, uh, uh, not as diffusion limited. All right, terbinafine works by inhibiting the first step of ergosterol synthesis, and that is squalene epoxidase. If you inhibit squalene epoxidase, you can't add this epoxide group and you cannot initiate ergosterol synthesis. And ergosterol is very, very important for the fungi's uh, cell membrane integrity. So something you need to know is that terbinafine is usually just reserved for the worst type of dermatophyte. Dermatophyte is just two Latin words. Derma means skin and phyte means eater. So these are just skin eaters. And it tar um, this terbinafine targets the worst type of them, which is oncomycosis or onychomycosis. And that just means um, nail fungi. So these are the nail eaters. Here's how onychomycosis would look like. The way I remember this is instead of just reading it as terbinafine, I try to read it as terrible fingers. The adverse effects are very uh, general. They're not very specific or unique to terbinafine. So they may not really ask you about the GI upset or the headache, but the most likely thing they'll ask is going to be the hepatos. Um, the hepatotoxicity, and maybe in a clinical setting, someone may ask you about the taste disturbances since compliance with the drug is very, um, it's very important that the drug doesn't taste horrible for compliance. Now let's talk about azoles. Azoles are going to be the highest yield drugs that, um, in the antifungal group. Uh, they all end in conazole, in the end of their name. So if you see con and then azol, you know we're talking about an azol. And they inhibit a fungal P450, a cyclase. Sometimes it's called demethylase, really. Um, and this just inhibits the, uh, the production of linosterol, which is the base unit for ergosterol. 
So uh, azoles are just used for pretty much any fungal infection. Uh, they can be used for local infections, less serious ones. Uh, fluconazole has very good uh, penetration into the brain, so it can be used to uh, target crypto. Uh, itraconazole has good lung penetration, so you can get uh, good targeting of histo, coccidio, and blasto. Um, ketoconazole uh, is more used for inhibiting uh, testosterone synthesis. Now, if you can try to think that if it inhibits fungal P450, it can inhibit our fungal P450, that is also a cyclase. And this cyclase is important for making hormones such as testosterone. So when you have these drugs, they can all inhibit testosterone synthesis, but ketoconazole is the most powerful at inhibiting our, um, our uh, desmolase or cyclase. And when you have reduced uh, testosterone, that's really good for diseases like benign prostatic hypertension. That's where your prostate grows too large and uh, uh, it's often triggered by high testosterone. Some other stuff that you may need to know for the clinical setting is um, clotrimazole and meconazole is used specifically for the skin. They're not oral, so they're just more of a cream format. And that's not going to be very useful for you until you get into your third and fourth year. Now, the adverse effects is going to be that they, of course, inhibit testosterone synthesis. And if you inhibit testosterone synthesis, you may get gynecomastia. Over here, I've showed you a picture of what gynecomastia is. It just looks like you've got a tanner stage development of breast tissue. And this can happen in, um, in females, but they're most likely going to target men when asking you in the question stem. Another thing, of course, um, is that you can get liver dysfunction. They're all inhibiting the P450 enzyme. So not only is it going to cause liver dysfunction, but it can cause a lot of drug interactions. If you're inhibiting the P450 system, you need to think about possible drug interactions of other drugs like warfarin or theophylline that may use the P450 system. Let's talk about amphotericin. Amphotericin over here has got two different segments to it. And that's why it's, it's got the ampho in its name. It's almost like an amphibian or an amphilic thing. Okay, an amphibian you would expect to stay in water and land. So amphotericin you would expect it to be hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Over here I've showed you a hydrophobic area, not a lot of OH groups like hydroxyl groups. Um, but the hydrophilic area has a whole lot of these um, hydroxyl groups, which attracts a lot of water. So why that's important is that this hydrophobic group will actually bind onto the ergosterol inside of the cell membrane. So over here, you've got it binding onto the ergosterol inside of the cell membrane. And then after a while, they start bunching up together and they make their own channels. So over here, you can see after a couple of them bunch up, they make their own channel. And this channel will release all the contents that is inside of the fungi and causing, um, killing it all together. So uh, the uses for it is just we keep it for very serious systemic infections, and you'll see why in a, um, in a little bit. You also need to know that it has zero bioavailability. You can't take amphotericin orally. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't get absorbed in your body. So you have to take it in IV form only. If, it goes, if you wanted to put it inside of your central nervous system for an infection there, you have to actually give it intrathecally. That's through a lumbar puncture. Now, the adverse effects um, is there's a lot actually, and a lot of people go on to call amphotericin amphoterable. So it may actually bind onto the cholesterol of the human cells because their gastrol and cholesterol are so similar, it may actually cause a lot of problems in humans. If these problems include uh, the shake and bake, you get a whole lot of fever and chills just um, when you're taking amphotericin. You can get, get IV phlebitis where it starts binding onto your veins and causes a lot of inflammation that you can see right here. You can get a lot of nephrotoxicity um, and this nephrotoxicity can cause you to waste water making hypotension. You can waste potassium from your kidneys and that can cause an arrhythmia and you can waste magnesium and that can cause a seizure risk. Another thing that ergosterol often does is it can be hepatotoxic. We said that we have a hydrophobic group right here. Uh, so usually with hydrophobic groups, uh, they need to be excreted by their liver. But this is pretty difficult for your liver to excrete, and it can cause a lot of hypotoxicity. Another thing is that it can cause anemia. Just imagine that it, it binding onto the cholesterol inside of the red blood cells, and it can cause a lot of anemia in that, in that mechanism.
let's talk about nystatin. It's pretty much the exact same thing as amphotericin. If you look at amphotericin and nystatin, it's pretty difficult to try to figure out what um, what the difference is. It's actually this this atom right here. So uh, if it's the same of an amphotericin, why do we even use it? Well, it's actually even more toxic than amphotericin. So it, we actually don't use it for the IV form. But because it has zero availability, it's actually safe to swallow. So we can use it to treat oral candidiasis or even in the esophagus. Uh, it can also be used to treat an external infection. As long as we don't get it um, inside of our blood, it can actually be fairly safe. So we can use it for topical dermatitis. So the adverse effects for an Istatin is pretty much nothing at all because we don't give it IV. It's too toxic for IV, but it's powerful enough that we can treat the infections that are on the outside of our body. Flucytosine, it's easy to figure out what it is just by looking at its name. I know that flu stands for fluorine and cytosine stands for cytosine. Now, if you've ever studied chemo drugs before, you would know that flu cytosine um, sounds a lot like flu um, fluorouracil or 5-fluorouracil, and that's exactly what it becomes. It goes into the fungi cells, and through a deamination process, you, get, you lose your amine group, and you become a uracil group. And this 5-FU is actually... The same, the same drug that we use for cancer. So again, um, the cytosine analog, uh, it goes, it gets, becomes deaminated and it becomes 5-fluorouracil, which is actually a chemo drug. But this time it's actually inside of the fungi and inhibits um, the thymidine synthesis, synthase inside of the enzyme, so the inside of the fungi. So the fungi has no way of producing DNA. Flucytosine is predominantly used for serious um, cryptococcal infections of the meninges or inside of your brain and it's often used in conjunction with amphotericin for very serious meningeal infections of crypto. Now the adverse effect is of course going to be the bone marrow suppression. You would expect that 5-FU being a chemo drug, you would expect it to inhibit not only the replication of the cryptococcus but also of your uh, white blood cells. And if you get an inhibition of your white blood cells, you can actually get what is called a dry tap or bone marrow suppression. You see this bone marrow here, it's got a lot of fat, but not very much white blood cells. Let's talk about griseofulvin, which is also very similar to chemo drugs. Uh, it actually deposits into your keratin, and I try to think of griseofulvin as like greasy skin or greasy full of skin. So. Uh, why I do that is because I want to remember that it gets deposited into your skin, into your nails, and into your hair. It binds onto the keratin there. And, it, and pretty much anything that's eating the keratin, like a dermatophyte, would actually get poisoned by the griseofulvin. And this griseofulvin poisons it by inhibiting the microtubules. Um, so if you inhibit the microtubules, you can no longer get mitosis um, through the metaphase. You inhibit the metaphase. So it's used predominantly for skin infections because that's where it builds up and the adverse effect is going to be mostly teratogenic. If you inhibit the microtubules, you have a risk of uh, inhibiting, uh, inhibiting the growth of the fetus. So it can cause a lot of problems in that response. Uh, it can also be carcinogenic. It can, it has a, um, it's likely to, it's not likely to cause cancer, but it, it is a risk that you need to mention to patients. It's, that's not very high yield for test taking purposes, but it may be useful during your clinical rotations. Something that you do need to know is that unlike um, azoles, it actually enhances the P450 rather than inhibit. So you would actually expect an increase in inhibition of warfarin. If your patient is also taking drugs like warfarin to inhibit an MI or a stroke, you need to actually increase their dose because taking griseofulvin will increase the metabolism of warfarin. So it'll reduce the amount of warfarin in their blood and it puts them at risk for MIs and strokes. All right. How do you treat fungal infections? It's fairly straightforward. If you have any localized infection, azoles is probably your best choice. But if it's a systemic infection, amphotericin is more than likely going to be your best choice. Uh, there are more specific stuff like uh, cryptococcal meninges, 
Uh, this is for immunosuppressed patients. If you don't know for sure if it has spread systemically and into the brain, you can just start treating with fluconazole. But if you have evidence that it has spread into the central nervous system and the brain, you want to switch the patient to flu cytosine and amphotericin, a combination therapy. Something else you need to know is that um, nystatin is good for more oral or vaginal candidiasis. Dermatophytes are um, often treated with griseofulvin because that builds up in the keratin. And then the really bad dermatophytes, like onychomycosis, can be treated with terbinafine. Uh, something you need to know about uh, cryptococcal infections uh, is that it is often an AIDS-defining illness. And so what we we don't really require you to know the clinical course for most treatments, but in this case, they, off, they may actually require it on an NBME test. Just know that fluconazole is good for preventing the progression into the central nervous system. But if it has already progressed the central nervous system, you want to be more aggressive with amphotericin and flu cytosine. So how you're going to use this information is that you're going to focus on the mechanism and the adverse effects. Just know the mechanism for all of these drugs. They're not extremely uh, high yield drugs, but the mechanism does come up occasionally. Uh, the adverse effects mostly is going to be about amphotericin because that has the most adverse effects. And uh, when you're dealing with a lot of the immunosuppressed patients, the AIDS patients, uh, you're going to have to deal with a lot of amphotericin and you have to be able to watch out for the adverse effects. Try to lump them up into groups for easier memory. Like the fungins, just try to think of them. They all target their cell wall. Ergosterol synthesis, just put them in one group. Um, ergosterol binding, like amphotericin and nystatin. And then just replication, like flucytosine and griseofulvin. Once you've grouped them up into different groups, it's a lot easier to think of them. Let's see if you're um, if you can apply this in a third year as a third year medical student. So let's say you're a third year medical student taking care of an AIDS patient, and the patient's coming to you with severe pneumonia. Sputum showed round yeast with a very thick capsule on India ink stain. So just knowing this uh, this uh, answer stem or this question stem, you already know that this thick capsule is how they often describe Cryptococcus, where it's just more of a capsule than it is the actual fungi. And this is very dangerous um, when, it when it spreads into the central nervous system of AIDS patients. So if the patient only has pneumonia, uh, fluconazole would be more than enough. As that'll keep it from spreading into the central nervous system and it can help fight the, bacteria, um, the fungi. However, you should probably get a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture just to make sure that it has not spread into the central nervous system. If you did find that crypto did spread into the central nervous system, then you need to change your treatment to amphotericin and flucytosine. All right, thank you and good luck.